Uh, okay, let's start. So just a quick reminder, uh, my office hours for today, if you need help with the homework, come. Uh, again, another reminder, we assign a quiz uh, normally every week. So I, it's highly unlikely that we skip a week, right, in the future. Maybe during the like, midterm preparation, stuff like that. But so just, uh, I usually put it on canvas, but if I forget, sorry, but just check the check the grade scope and it will be assigned there. I think I screwed up uh, this weekend because I accidentally left the uh, time limit on the quiz, which was wrong because, I mean, we I used to time quizzes in the past. Then I decided, okay, maybe it's not worth it. So quizzes should be on time. So if you if you see a time limit, just shoot me a, an email or a Piazza message and I will try to remove it. So that said, so I removed the time limit. And if you already submitted, I extended the deadline until tonight. So just please resubmit. I think grade scope should be should get you a chance to resubmit. If I'm wrong again, should me an email. Uh okay, that's where we are. Uh any questions or anything about logistics? All good? Okay, let's start then. So just a reminder, this is where we are in the in the lecture. So we are talking about linking and loading. So our high-level goal is to understand what is that inside a process, right? So what is that that what compiler generates? And if we have a file on disk which will be saved in some format, right? So what do we need to do as an operating system designer to load it in memory, right? So it's kind of logical, right? So in the end, the goal of the operating system is to run programs, right? So if you if you know how to load them in memory, you're almost there, right? So, and you can say, look, I, I don't really need any isolation. I'm not gonna set up page tables or anything like that. I just wanna run my stuff kind of Adrena style on some kind of a microcontroller. So arguably knowing what's inside the program is really kind of the most important thing. And from there you can build extensions, right? So uh, someone, what is that? Someone on, on Piazza was saying, okay, I wanna, I, I wanna have a bootable USB stick, which I plug into my machine and I, it boots into Doom or Quake or something like that, right? And okay, so this is how you start. So you say, look, I will take my uh, Quake executable and uh, I will load it. And our next homework, not this coming homework, but the homework after that. So we'll teach you how to boot into main, right? So from there on, you can say, look, I, I, I booted into main on a real machine. Uh, I know what's inside my Doom executable file. I'll load into memory and I'll try running it. I mean, it will not work obviously, right? Because uh, it will try to open a file the Quake itself, maybe some configuration file, right? At this point, you have to decide what to do next, whether you want to implement this as a library or you want to build a real kernel which has a file system, stuff like that. But this is where you will be right soon. Okay, so this is our quest. So we try to understand what is this relocation linking and loading, right? So remember, I was trying to say that typically we build programs as, as individual files. And uh, what we do is essentially... Uh, Compiler builds them separately, like this is m.c and this is a.c. Uh, m.c implements the, implements the main function. It has a global variable, hello world. It calls a function, passing this string as an argument. And then the a.c file implements uh, the a function itself, which takes a string as an argument. And what it does, it writes it on a standard output, right? With the write function, providing one as a standard output file descriptor, 
and the string pointer and the size of the string itself, right? And uh, com the compilers or whatever you build, you build tool chain will will build two object files, right? And uh, uh, as we as the compiler builds it, it says, okay, I don't really have an implementation for the a function, but I do have this definition of the a function. So why does compiler needs it? Why do we need this uh, line external void a char pointer? <laughs> First of all, why would you do this instead of just bringing some other like AI? It's equivalent. So, um, so in this specific example, just for the right, so the common practice would be along with this a.c file, have another file, which uh, will be called something a.h, right? And in that file, we would put uh, void uh, a char pointer s for example right mm -hmm. and this is kind of like like a one liner for this file it's it's the same in an input file you can oh, you can again share it between multiple you don't have to like write this line in every file which tries to use a you just write the include right you can group multiple functions you can provide definitions of data structures so uh, again don't want to get into the debate like arguably C's approach to like modularity is not the best but it, again it's like it's 50 years old so like <laughs> it's, it's just let's not uh, yell too much right but that's 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 this line is essentially does the same as an include right but uh why do we need this line or this line inside the include file great so the program, first of all, needs a function signature to type check and also to compile the uh, caller side code, right? So when we essentially, when compiler wants to compile something like this, the end result will be call of an address of A, and even if we don't know yet, but some address, right? But what will happen with this argument is we can do something like push off the address of the string on a stack, right? And remember, I, I said, yes, we need to compile this call side, caller side code. But what you mentioned is actually, you're making a great point. So technically speaking, you can compile the caller side code just, just from this line, right? And it will be just fine because I already know the arguments. I know that there will be one uh, an argument and I know the type, it's a pointer to a string, right? So I know how to generate this push here, right? Mm -hmm. However, if I suddenly make a mistake and I add another argument, a string b, for example, if I blindly follow this line, my compiler would generate something like push string and push b here, right? Mm -hmm. And we'll happily try to execute this code. But of course, since types do not match, so the type of the function takes only one argument. And here I'm trying to push in two, the stack layout will be different, right? And the, you will eventually crush in some mysterious way. That's why having this line is helps you to type check, meaning that, okay, you type, type, type check that you're first calling a function with two arguments or one argument in this example. Uh, and the arguments, the types of the arguments do match, right? So that's, that's an interesting nuance that, that this line tells you, okay, I believe that the types are correct. Of course, you can say, look, uh, what about if I like just put B here, like as a second argument? Well, that's up to you. You believe that you're calling a function with two arguments at this point, the compiler will blindly say, well, you want it, we'll do it, right? And then you will cross uh, at linking time, right? So be careful. C is not like, a safe language. So it will, it will blindly follow what you say. Okay, so we got the point, right? So we need this extern a declaration. Okay, cool. So last time we said, okay, so we we did take a look at the uh, what's inside the main file. So here we said, okay, look, it generates two sections, text and data. Data is not uh, zero because it has hello world, exactly 16 bytes, which is hex 10. Uh, we remember that uh, we know where, where the sections start. Uh, the compiler just uh, 
uh, generated uh, uh, a text starting at zero and uh, the data section started like 16 bytes and just so happens that the whole code of this program is exactly 16 bytes. Just a coincidence if you carefully count like one, two, three, plus five, and so on, right? You will get 16. Uh, main is currently linked to be exec to executed at address zero, just because again, we put the, the text section starting at address zero, why not, right? Just, and we say, okay, look, there's a couple of relocation entries, one to push the string because it's a global variable. So right now it's in a, in a data section at address uh, X10, right? And, uh, that's to implement this call side. And then we have the function A itself. We don't really know where it is. So compiler says just, I'm gonna just simply call zero just to call something, right? So, and to cross in a, in a less, in a more predictable manner, right? So it's a chance so it says like, I'll call negative, negative 13 because uh, we'll talk a little bit about it in the, you know, like x86 allows you uh, addressing for the call instruction, you can address relative to the next instruction. So this next instruction starts at eight plus five by 13. So negative 13 brings you back to address zero when you call it, right? And uh, that's what I was trying to explain at the very end of previous lecture. Okay, and just to warm up a little bit, uh, mm, let's take a look at this second file, right? So it's you kind of can guess that it will the compiler will generate something similar, right? So and again we see that, uh, and I'm here I'm using an obj dump with the two which can read the object file, right? And in this case uh, they say okay by the way we generated again two sections text and data, uh, text starts at zero and data starts at one c. Uh, and we also, an interesting bit here is the data is actually zero bytes. So, because there are no global variables in this, in this file. So there is nothing to allocate in a, in a global data section. That so happened, right? Okay, cool. So, and uh, again, if we uh, look at this source code, right? This part, I'll ask you a question, like what needs to be relocated? And let's let's answer this question as a poll. So again, well, polling activity, I provide the URL. Let me go and enable it, uh, make it live. Where is my stuff? Really? On a good day, polling works, but on a bad day, does not, which is probably fine. Do, do, do. Okay, I enabled that activity. So if we, do you see it on the screen? Yeah. So I'm asking you a question in this file, in this source file, what needs to be relocated? Which symbols? And we can, meanwhile, probably look at the, I'll give you a little bit of time, then we'll look at the answers. Uh, remember the file A dot C will be compiled separately, right? Technically speaking, it doesn't know yet, and not technically for real, it doesn't know that it will be linked again, you can see later. But uh, at later, when it will get linked, what symbols inside this file will need to be relocated? So everyone answered in class? Anyone is still waiting? Okay, let me then quickly switch to this uh, activity. So let me pa, pa, pa. do this. It doesn't work. Here. So let 
me switch back to what's it? The polling activities are hiding from me. Like I just had you here. So this is what people answered, right? So, so people believe that address of A has to be relocated, address of S, address of write, uh, address of string clan. So, but majority thinks that address of A has to be relocated, right? Okay, let's go back to the, let's get, get back to this uh, to this presentation, right? Uh, so let me ask you a question again. So what needs to be relocated when you link? Like what kind of symbols or what kind of parts, what, what parts of the program need, need to be relocated? Say again, global symbols. Are there any global symbols here? No. Well, global variables, right? We don't have global variables, but we, we do have global function symbols, right? So this A, one would guess that this A will be compiled and linked to B at address zero, because why not, right? We start there. But then when we're gonna merge the text sections, right? We're gonna merge with main, with A, with write, with string land, right? So A has to be like moved around, agree with this? So A needs to be relocated, right? Agree with this? What about S? An argument? No. No, why not? That's just going to be on stack. Correct. So this address of S will be on a stack and it will be already provided here. So here it will be relocated, but in this file, okay, nothing, right? So, and it doesn't have to be relocated here and here just because it's either on a stack or in some, some register. But of course it's on a stack when we call a function because we follow a function, a calling convention. Okay, what about write? Where is this function? Correct, so these two, write and string clan, are not known, right? Because they are external. Because as you said, remember this external line and you ask me why not to make and do an include. So in this, in this example, we do a canonical approach in C. So we say, well, let's include standard string functions and standard, uh, what is that? Like input and output file descriptors, I guess, right? So the one which define right and yeah, and in and, and this example, just right, right? And string plan will be defined in uh, like as a prototype in string.h, right? So, but those will be compiled to be uh, dummy addresses right now. And later, when we know when they come from standard library like libc in case of uh, C, right? Then we will gonna resolve those addresses, right? They agree with this? Is that clear? Okay, so we patch the addresses. Let me close the activity. Anyone is still answering? All good. Uh, let me quickly close it here as long as I can like switch to it successfully. Uh, again, let me like, disable it. Okay, cool. So let me show you like specifically how these three symbols, what happens to them, right? So um, as we said, okay, we, we don't know yet where the string clan is. So we're going to Again, that's a coincidence that it's the same address, so it's minus 13 again, and we just jump back to zero, right? So we just, for the sake of it, some dummy address, we, we call back to zero. But the compiler will mark this address in the source code saying, okay, I really don't know where the symbol is. I know the name of the symbol, string land, str land, right? And then in a special table at the end of the file, it will say, okay, this symbol isn't resolved, so please find it later when you actually link everything together, right? So similar for this write function, not surprisingly, it has three arguments. So like calling convention, we push them on a stack. And again, we say, wow, we don't know where it is. Right now it's a different offset. So 11 plus five will be 16. So it's minus 16. 
uh, again, pull back to zero for now, just in case if we fail the linking step or re relocation step later, we'll just crash in a less uh, like mysterious way, right? So, and the symbol A itself, because right now it's at zero, right? And for whatever reason, object dump doesn't mark that this has to be relocated, right? But it does, right? So because when you merge it with, and it's a global symbol visible in a file, and so when you merge it with m.c or m.o, you will have to move this around. Question. So can you put over lights so like minus 13, 16, all that thing? Or is that not really using No, of course, like it's it's nice to know everything, right? I think it's it's a random choice. I mean, it's it's one of the pragmatic choices. So you can put any address, you can put O zeros, right? And it's okay. You will just call address zero. But what if zero contains something? Like it maybe it contains your data section. And if your operating system is not sophisticated enough to disable execution of in the data section, you will start executing data. You will start the, the fetch the code execute loop will start start fetching, let's say hello world. Anything can be there. Maybe it's a valid instruction. Maybe you will immediately crash with an exception, but maybe not. And you run until you really, you really crash. It sometimes takes you far away, and it's try to it's hard to reconstruct what is happening. So I've seen two conventions. In this example, it just jumps back to zero. In another example, it will just be minus five, which means that the next instruction minus five, you will loop exactly to the same instruction. And it will be looping there. That's even probably even better. So if you suddenly see my program crashed, I have a sec fold, and you see that you're looping on this line, not on line zero, but you're immediately looping on this line. Is you, you might think, okay, look, I, I probably failed the linking step, right? But you can choose any address. But those are those are good choices, right? Just to prevent some debugging of mysterious crashes. Question. Uh, Call string line or write uh, or a they, they both use zero right well, why they don't use each some different signature to say for different functions and then if if they all use zero so how will the linker find them out go back to the source file no hold on so this address is just kind of a safety mechanism to say if you never when you when you were when you were when you get a link them together, if you never did anything to this address, at least something what will help you to debug the issue happens. And this something in this case would just jump to address zero. As I said, that may not be the best choice. Maybe it's better to just loop around to the same instructions to kind of like call the same address, like relative minus five. You're going to be calling the same instruction over and over. The, the other question is, how do we really find that we need to do something with this address, right? And when you compile the, uh, when you compile a.c, the compiler will generate a table oh. with addresses of all locations in the code, which have to be patched mm -hmm. when you move the sections around. Mm -hmm. And those this table will contain a string name or symbolic name of a symbol, strlan, and then you say, look, I know that this symbol is needed. I will search through all my libraries trying to find this symbol. If I find it, I know where it is in memory at this point, and then I will patch the address. See. Right? Is that clear how it works? Thank you. And uh, just to like, again, just to reiterate how it works, uh, this is how we essentially produce an executable. We take multiple text segments from multiple files from like a.o, m.o, and in our case, probably libc, uh, which probably comes as a static library .a, which I will explain in a second what it means. And we just merge them together. And we do the same for the data segments. So literally the picture will look something like that, right? So you have multiple object files with multiple text sections, one, two, and three, and you merge them together, right? And if this one was starting at address zero, 
Now it would start at address, let's say 600, right? Just because it's right on top of the previous one. And you say, I don't need a gap because there is no reason for me to introduce this gap. So we just put it there, like MEM CPI into that, into that location, right? But of course, if, if you were calling something within this module, right? If it's a relative address, then fine. But if it was uh, like, a, if you said, okay, I'm gonna I compile it in such a way that I use an absolute address, then you have to patch this, the address of the call side to make sure that it's no longer points somewhere close to zero, but instead points somewhere close to 600 where this, this function is found here, right? And uh, just again, just to be more specific that this happens for the text and the data sections and they just merge together and the BSS size is just simply growing. So like the end, like this can come from, for example, a.o, this was from m.o, which we compiled, and this one comes, for example, from libc.o, for example, right? And in the end, this is your program, right? Which the linker essentially just assembled together. At this point, it's kind of almost ready to run, and I will in a second explain what needs to be done, right? But if you look at the addresses inside, that will, that's, that's what it will look at the, at the very end, right? So there is a little bit of interesting thing here. So there is a function, start C, which actually executes before main, right? which is a little unusual, right? Because, I mean, you would, you, would, you would probably guess that main should execute first, right? But in practice, the entry point of this file is actually start .c, start dash C, and this one calls main, which is actually like sits at this address, right? So why, why do we need this? Why do we need to, to, to run something before main? Like uh, the main still need a stack or a memory initialization. Oh. Well, but maybe this function also needs a stack, right? So maybe operating system has to create a stack before even jumping to this mm. start dash C. Uh, Sometimes yes. Uh, sometimes, uh, no. sometimes you might negotiate something with the OS, and uh, in a pragmatic case, when you link against uh, uh, dynamic libraries, actually you will start the linker, and the linker will run before me and actually like read the files. You know those object files uh, on on the Unix machines they are called .dot so shared objects. On Windows, they are called uh, DLLs. Mm -hmm. And this dynamic linker will be sitting, running before your main, reading the libraries uh, like in memory, linking them before you even run. So linker actually runs inside the process before me, and then it will jump to main. We're not gonna get uh, into uh, those details with XV6, but that's one reason. So you might run a linker, uh, but even if everything is linked statically, uh, in what case you might need some to run something before main? Like, uh, does it what? Set our CRV, you mean arguments to main or? It happens as well, I believe, but uh, I, I'm a little fuzzy on, 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 on these details. So most likely your answer is correct. But what I wanted to actually emphasize is that remember you have, like you probably all know C++. C++ allows execution of constructors. Uh, you can define a variable in a global scope. This variable might have a constructor. In C++, constructors can actually execute, which is a little funky, right? So in a language Rust, like Rust, those global constructors cannot execute. They have to be declarative, meaning you can set them to zero or something. But in C, they can really run in C++. Like they can open a file, right? And uh, the question is like, where, where will they run? Like they have to run before main because maybe the first line in main uses this variable to like write into a file, right? And so, and this is the answer. So essentially, like all of what you said is correct. So sometimes it's a link or something, some like it, it does something with environment uh, variables, but it also it runs uh, sometimes constructors. 
And uh, ironically, C actually has a, a similar mechanism. So it may be well hidden from you, but there is a directive to the compiler to say, please execute this part before me. And so, yeah, sometimes something may run before me. Uh, again, in XV6, we will be using this flavor of C, which uh, will never does anything like that. So like, don't get surprised. So the very first function which you're going to execute in XV6 will be actually main. There will be you know this wrapper, but you can, you can do some some wrapping like that. So for example, you may uh, say, remember that the program exit with exits with the exact exit system call, right? Mm -hmm. But normally when you program in C, you never invoke anything like exit, you just return from main, right? So for example, this wrapper can, like when the main returns, can actually explicitly call this exit system call to exit the program, right? Because the operating system will not kill the program just because you exited main. You have to do something. You have to either crash, which is probably not ideal, or explicitly exit from a program, right? Agree? Okay, cool. So we uh, we linked uh, executed main. So remember, this is our string, which is now in the data section. The data section is currently starts at the second kilobyte. So this address uh, 2000 in hex is a... Uh, is, uh, uh, bah, bah, bah. Sorry, it's two multiplied by four nine six, right? So it's actually around eight kilobytes, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, let's write it this way: eight kilobytes, right? So not surprising, the address is somewhere there. So we patched it to have this uh, address to correctly push the address of the hello world on a the stack. Then we say we're gonna call a, and here we use the relative. Uh, address instead of looping back to me like we did before, we actually use a positive offset saying, okay, yeah, it's plus three bytes after this next instruction. And this is exactly where A sits in this, in a, in a final uh, merged text section, right? Okay, so then we, uh, that's just plus three. Uh, then we, and, and I wanted to explain, like what I wanted to explain here is that uh, every time, like if you're confused about something, uh, you can like really look it up online and there will be like a tiny table for the call instruction, which will specifically tell you that it is allowed to use a relative addressing mode, which is a displac displacement relative to the next instruction. So essentially not this current instruction, but the next one. That's why it becomes plus three here, right? So because it's AC plus three and then uh, AC five. plus five, sorry, right? Because yeah. this is the size of five and then plus three and you will end up exactly with yeah. this address, right? That's their, the choice of the CPU designers who designed the x86 instruction set. That seems convenient, right? Uh, in fact, very convenient because if you really, uh, uh, if all the calls are relative calls, then, you know, when you relocate something, you don't have to do with them, right? And again, like the compilers do generate different uh, generate different code, but uh, like typically this is used, this trick is used. Okay, so, and then uh, again, same relative addresses of string strlan and write functions, so similar trick. So here it's plus hex 37 plus hex a2, and again, those functions are in the same, in the same uh, linked executable file. Right. This is what you end up after merging everything together. Right. Any questions about it? This. Okay. Cool. So, in a second, we will talk about how to load this thing in memory and get it running. Right. But before that, remember, I keep saying this object files and stuff like that. So, like, and I implied that this is something what compiler generates. But let's just quickly take a look at what is there in those object files. So if I, again, if I ask you a question, so what do you think should be there? Symbol table, yeah, because we know that uh, symbol table, and it's some kind of encoding of all addresses, like, let's put it this way. So if you provide an address, you say, like, if you provide a symbol, like a function A, you can say that the it's it sits in, at, at at a specific address inside my program, 
If you don't have a symbol like right, you say, okay, this is unresolved. And the, the linker has to figure out that right should come to some other file. So from a file which provides right. And its, its address is known here, right? So symbol table, good. So what else? We obviously need some relocation information. So likely we need some kind of a table which says inside my old program, I can, you can encode it somehow that those addresses, like address, for example, where we pushed the string on a, on a, on a, on a stack needs to be patched. So meaning if we move it in memory, we have to do something with that address, right? And here you might have an encoding of what to do, either put a symbol, like, like a, a, an address of a global symbol, or maybe just shift by adding some delta because you're just moving it in memory back and forth, right? And uh, again, I don't want to get into like too much details how those tables are organized. It's probably not as important. We're not, not going to see them. But the other couple of things, but conceptually we need them, right? And what else we need? We need uh, like essentially just the text itself, right? The text of the program and the data section and the size of the BSS, right? Because we want to load this and put those to zeros, right? Uh, and more or less, maybe that's it, right? So, and really, so conceptually, the very minimal object file will have this only five kinds of this information. So like when you open a file, it will just start with a header which will specify sizes of other sections and their location in a file. So the object code, it's just essentially this text section, right? So we have relocation information for what needs to be patched. We have a symbol table to find unresolved symbols and the symbols which we provide here. Uh, and here we also have uh, debugging information, which we didn't talk about, but normally when you, you execute your Visual Studio Debugger or GDB. Sometimes, often you want to, you don't want to stare at this at the assembly code, right? Sometimes you do, and specifically in this class, but probably no one ever in their lives uh, looked at assembly code before, right? So all the debugging happens at the level of source code, right? So like that's fine unless you have a compiler bug or bug in the runtime, which in a language runtime, like someone didn't do the linking right correctly then you're fine, right? So you don't have to deal with it. But debug information essentially, like it's a mapping between assembly instructions and the, sor and, and the source code line, sometimes the source of the program itself because you carry it around and this debugger can open it, right? You don't have, you don't like, you can, you, can, you can just have the actual source around. And if you ask yourself, okay, what, uh, what kind of an object file, what, what kind of format uh, the file should implement, uh, the, one of the early formats, which is which was called A out, right? And this is the historical convention when you run GCC and it spits out the file which is called A out. So that was one of the first executable files. So today it's actually it's not A out. It's actually ELF, but the name is just A out, right? But this 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 format was very very simple. So it has a at the beginning of a file it had this A out header. Uh, then the text and data sections and other sections like relocation, symbol table, debug in full. And again, if you say, okay, what if I want to read this file and load something in memory? Uh, like you say, look, I first probably need to know what's inside this header, right? So in C, you define a data structure, which looks like this. So it's, it will be just a bunch of integer fields, which you use as offsets, right? Which represent offsets, uh, most of them. So in, in the, so the header will look exactly like this. So the, the very beginning is a magic number. So just like some encoding that we, you open a file, you want to see, is it a Perl script or maybe is it an A out file for real? And yes, this magic, if the magic matches, yes, it's executable A out, A out file. Then it will be, the next field is essentially the, I think it's actually the size of the text section, the size of the data section, the size of the BSS section, the size of the symbol table, the uh, the address of the entry point, and uh, this is the 
uh, bah, 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 forgot exactly, but it's somehow in codes where the relocation table is, right? So, but relatively simple, right? And you say, look, I, I can probably write C code, which can read this header, put the file in memory. And if you ask yourself a question, so, but what needs to be done? Like really, I open a, a out header, how, will, how am I going to load it in memory? So the procedure is uh, relatively simple. So you say, look, I, I'm looking at the header. I know where the text section is in, in my file, right? And so, well, I will probably somehow reserve the memory uh, in uh, inside the reserve some space inside the memory of the process, and just simply essentially copy the text section from the file into the memory of the process. Right. Uh, similar for the data section, just reserve, copy. For the BSS, you just know the size of the BSS, so you just set it. Uh, you just allocate space in the process and set everything to zeros, right? And you say, well, in order to run, remember we discussed how what the operating system is doing. It says, okay, it needs a heap, and the heap will be growing, right? That's that's the space available right above the BSS, for example, and we just set a stack to some address which we choose. And essentially at this point, EAP is set to the entry point. And you're good to go, right? So it's relatively simple. Question. Um, you won't be able to put the data. It has to go in specifically into those into those addresses, right? And uh, and the class is uh, uh, I I. Should admit I, I use a out as an example, but I'm missing the fact how it includes the actual addresses at which these sections are linked. So, but uh, uh, again, I, I wanted to use it for illustration purposes, but for real kind of homework assignment, we're going to use elf, which I explained in a second, right? But just wanted to make sure that we understand that at a high level, at least, it's relatively simple to do it. And uh, like, any other questions about it? We're good. So essentially I have a I have a, a slide which discusses the same, but really what we use today is a slightly more involved uh, object format, which is called ELF, which stands for executable and linkable format. So the problem with A out was that it's really wasn't flexible enough to represent all the use cases, right? And so this use cases were the following. So I mentioned that uh, Compiler just generates this object files and we have to keep them around. We also want to keep something what is called a static library, which is essentially a collection of object files. We also know that we sometimes want to use shared libraries or dynamic, dynamically linked libraries in Windows, right? Uh, and we want to keep around the executable files which are ready to run themselves, right? And AI wasn't like good enough to represent all the use cases in, a, in an elegant way. And so people came up with a generic format. So all of these files are on Linux machines are kept as ELF files, right? And let's take a look at what, what's inside the ELF. Conceptually, it's again, similar to what we've just seen inside the AL. So uh, at the very beginning of the file, we'll have a ELF header, right? So this ELF header will open up the file. And very similar, there will be like a magic uh, number there, which you can check and say, okay, is it really uh, the L file which I'm opening? Or maybe it's a text file. It will things like uh, pointer to the entry uh, point of the program, right? So essentially just pointer, which goes and points in one of these sections. And typically, as I said, remember, something is executing inside uh, even before main. So this is typically called a dot init section, which stands for this initialization, right? But what's important to this L file is that it will have two tables. So one table is, is called this program header table. So it sits here and it has pointers to other parts of the L file. And roughly speaking, it contains information about how to load this file in memory. So very similar to A out, you just say, look, 
I look at this table, it will contain a couple of entries, let's say two, maybe one sometimes, and you can just simply load them in memory. And it will contain information about where they have to be loaded, like virtual addresses, their sizes and stuff like that. And notice here, so I use this green color. So those sections can be something like an executable section, which you just simply copy in memory and it contains both your init section and the text section, right? So, oh, sorry. Uh, bug with this, uh, right? So, and it doesn't like, when you're loading, you don't, at this point, you don't really care whether there's a two different, they were generated somehow differently. One is a part which needs to initialize the program and one which is really main text section, right? So similar, you just have to know that it has to be loaded with executable permissions and it's ready to run. Similar, it has something like a, writable sections for uh, global data variables, read-only section for read-only global variables and stuff like that. So in the size of a B, like BSS and stuff, right? So this first table, which is a program header table is used for loading. And I will explain in, in a second how it works. So, and the second table, which typically sits at the, at the end of the L file is called a section header table. And this information, this table contains a more detailed information about uh, all this, which is required for essentially linking and relocating the file. So it will have this relocation tables and stuff like that. And essentially the, it kind of splits the two goals. So loading to memory is just a program header table. You just blindly iterate with this table and load everything to memory and then you're ready to run. And if you want to relink this file, so maybe, maybe it was an object file and you want to merge two object files together, the linker uses the set second table, which essentially says, okay, look, I know that inside you have this, all this information about what needs to be patched and everything like that, right? So let me show you a more specific example. So again, uh, at the very end, I will be using a tool which reads an elf. So it's called read elf, right? So, but what happens here, I say, I, I take some kind of hello world program, use a GCC compiler. I say, do not generate position independent code. Uh, do not use built-in libraries, uh, uh, link everything statically, uh, generate 32-bit code, generate uh, debug info in the GDB format. Uh, do not omit frame pointer and use this file as an input. And please do not link, just simply compile, right? And then I say, look, uh, I will do a little bit of magic on this file. So I will, uh, uh, this will produce A out. And I will just say, please make sure that the text section starts at zero and uh, the entry point is main, right? But that's probably less important, just an example. So, and this read elf will happily tell me what inside the elf file. So it's say, okay, I found an elf pattern. There's this magic number which sits there. So it looks like elf. So it's specifically ELF32 and stuff like that, right? Uh, and then it will like will find this information which we were talking about. So it will say, look, uh, the entry point of the program is address zero. So like like you asked, we compiled the main is still at the address zero. Maybe some function could be sitting above main. So it's like the fact that main is zero, it's just a coincidence, right? But this address will, will match the entry point, right? It says, okay, how many, uh, where is the table which contains the program headers? It says it's 52 bytes into the file, right? So it's relative of set from the beginning of the file. And where is the, the section headers table, the one which sits at the end? It says, okay, it says it's 2980 bytes into the file. So it says, then the following thing, uh, what is the size of this header? It's just 52 bytes. That's pretty standard, but headers can be of variable size. So it actually has it size of the program headers, so 32 bytes. So this table is 32 bytes and it contains only two entries. It's a very simple ELF, so it only contains two entries. Size of the section headers table, a more involved table, 40 bytes, and the number of entries in the table is 15, right? So this is essentially, it just dumps this thing which, which, which you need to understand what's inside that ELF, right? And uh, Again, if we first take a look at the program header table, so that's the one, and I, I get it. So the names are almost identical. I get confused, like program section, 
uh, a little bit weird, but fine. Okay, one is for loading, one is for linking, right? So this is the one which, which is for loading. So those green pointers go to this locations in the file saying, okay, just do something. And we only have two of them in this specific example, right? So again, if you uh, uh, scroll down in the output of Redelf, it will say, tell you, okay, I found two program headers. Uh, one is loadable type, another is a stack type. So in this, uh, it says, okay, it starts in, within the file, it starts in, at an offset hex 74. You have to load it at virtual address zero, right? And essentially you have all of it, all of this information to make sure that you can take this, load it in memory, jump to the entry point, you're ready to run. And that will be part of your homeworks. Essentially, I will provide the definition for the L header, and you will have to write a loop, which essentially iterates through those program header entries. Like first reads the header, finds the position of the program header table in the file, reads the program uh, header table, and then iterates through each entry and loads the one which are loadable in memory, right? And it, everything will be so simple that you will just load them and you will know where the entry point is and you will jump to that thing, right? So again, it, again, the way it works, the way why it works is that for you, that it's relatively sim simple, right? So let me just step back again. So, and explain how it can be done one more time. Lincoln is a little bit more, Harder, but this one is easy. So you open an L file. You have a you read this, the L header, right? From the L header, you will understand the location of the program header, program header table within the file. As I was just as a short, like there will be just a field in this data structure. Then you read the whole table and you iterate. Sorry, you iterate entry by entry, and each entry will point somewhere in a file, and if the if the type of this is a load, then you just load it at an address at which it tells you to load it, right? Or you might, in our homework, we're gonna play a little bit with an addresses because we're we're gonna be loading an ELF inside an already existing process. So it's not really like a full operating system. So we'll just allocate memory and there will be instructions for how to do that, right? But conceptually kind of easy, right? Let's find the table, iterate through the table, load everything in memory. That's what I was trying to explain. But we'll give you a first-hand experience for how to do it, right? Any questions? Yeah, okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, so just two entries in this specific uh, example. And if we take a look at the second table, it contains more detailed information. It's kind of like split the loading step and linking step. This table is used by the linker, right? So it's essentially used for exactly what we were just discussing uh, all this time. So like merging or linking code and data sections together between multiple object files. So it will contain information about the text section, data section, read-only data section, BSS, uh, symbol table, stuff like that, right? And so if you, again, if you look at the output of this uh, readelf file, readelf tool, uh, you will see that we have uh, 15 entries, right? And each will have a name. So it says, okay, a text. Uh, it will figure out, like, it will contain information about where it is in the file, size, stuff like that. Again, I, we never will be relocating a file. So, but just for info, right? Read only data, uh, elf header frame, data, BSS. Don't remember what comments are. This is like different kinds of debug information, symbol table, and stuff like that, right? So it's all what linker needs and there will be a link from the homework. You can read more about those fields, understand how it works, but it's probably less important for you. And again, just, just my, my high level pitch here is that if everything is already, if, you're, if your L file is really an executable file, which is linked statically, like essentially all the write function, string length function, everything is resolved, merged in those data sections and text sections, right? So really to load an elf in memory, the operating system will simply, like it will open this file, will look at this header, again, will locate this field, which points to the program header table within a file. So read the program header table from the file, 
well, like it will have a size and the number of entries, right? So it will, it's easy to read. And then you essentially, in a loop, will essentially say, okay, this entry says it's a load entry. And it says, okay, so it knows where it is in the file. So you load it in memory. And at some point, you can just jump to the entry point, right? So not super hard conceptually, right? But a lot can go wrong. So debugging will be hell. But that's where that's where you say, like, remember I showed you that sometimes you want to check that instructions which you assumed you're going to execute, you will just uh, print out them on the screen and see, okay, yeah, it really like pushes CPP on a stack. So it looks correct to me. So probably beginning of main or whatever you link their stack frame, maintaining the stack frame, right? So, okay. So just to quickly... Uh, 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 just energize ourselves. Let's quickly do a small poll for people who are online and not participating. So the question I'm asking is, uh, which table do we use to load an L file? So it's a very simple question. It's a embarrassingly simple, but uh, let's still answer it really, really quickly. Where's my mouse pointer? Look, beauty, I lost my mouse pointer. On a Mac, mouse pointer shouldn't be lost, people. Really? <laughs> oh, on the other screen? So where is it? Ah, oh, man, and where is that screen? Ah, got it back. Thank you. <laughs> now I just have to figure out where my... my where my polling tool is. Now I lost the taskbar. Uh, is it alive, this activity? Let's try to answer. So which table do we use to load the L file? Section header table or a program header table? Uh, and just to make sure that we understand, I will switch back to here. Yeah. Nah, again. Let me just take a look again. Now should be alive. So two tables. Which one is used for loading? I hope everyone is correct on this yeah. one. Which one is which? Everyone answered? Yes, anyone is, okay. So surprisingly, uh, surprisingly, we still have people who believe that, uh, uh, we still have people, man, like that will kill me. So who believe that the section header table is used for loading. Okay. So do we have uh, anyone in the class or some people believe that both tables are used for loading, right? Remember, that's the whole point of making the L file is to separate these two actions of linking, relocating, and the second action, loading. Loading is very, very simple. So that's why we can build this X with six operating system in such a, in like 9,000 lines of code, because we're simply taking an L file and just reading this simple table, loading it in memory, right? You will see the source code later. You'll build it in your, in your, homework right so you don't need those boss tables you just need this one program header table simplifies a lot right at this point if everything is linked relocated ready to run just just read this table load it in in memory okay clear okay thanks for participating let's uh just quickly switch it off and go back to the lecture uh okay so we got it. 
So we got that we have this magical formula L. When I was your age, I was still perpetually confused about static libraries, dynamic libraries, executable files, object files. Didn't know what these are. And I was working for money back then, like as a software developer. A, dot A, whatever, doesn't care. Okay, let's take a look at what these are. So if I ask you a question, do you guys know what the static libraries are? You're better than me, I guess. So who can tell me? Correct. So those static libraries, are like an archive of multiple object files. In fact, it is an archive, right? So Unix uses this archive format, which is comes from this AR tool, right? And literally what it looks like inside is that you, you have a C file, etui, for example, .c, printf.c. You run it through GCC compiler, for example. It produces an object file. This is an elf, right? Remember in our case, in a modern case, right? And it just uses this AR tool to just bundle everything together as an archive, like gzip or something, but it's a different format into ellipse.a, right? So it's simply a collection of object files inside. And the way it works is that really, like if you wanna do it by hand, you just call this command line, which says, okay, like I have a bunch of object files, bundle them together into this library, right? Uh, and when then C compiler calls a linker, for example, internally, when you say, look, I want to link my main.c file against this library, it will just unpack this archive and just find the object files, go through all object files, figure out all, this, all the symbols which are provided or missing, and try to combine them together in such a way that your program is ready to run, right? So an alternative way of invoking is, is to say, look, I like just minus L flag, and then here you skip the full name and just an elip prefix, right? You just say the library name is class, right? So it will be, in case of a libc, it will be just C, right? Uh, or you can explicitly call a linker and say, look, I am trying to link against this library and this will be picked up from a uh, one of the well-known paths in the system. And it's roughly, it's, it's identical to like, to passing all these object files to an input of a compiler, just saying, okay, link against all of these object files. So static libraries are relatively simple. So uh, why do we need them? So what's the point? So you do some very, uh, very abstract functions. No, like in this example, I, you can guess from this name of a file that this implements a printf function. It might be reasonably sophisticated, right? So building correct printf, especially printf, which is hard to exploit, is, a, is an art, to be honest. So it's not easy. And so someone wrote it, compiled it for you, and you never touch it. You just link against libc.a. As you say, you just use a header file, which will provide the the signature of the printf function, right? And you're done. Like in, in your main.c, it will just be an unresolved symbol. And later on, you just link against this library, right? So you hide so essentially just this idea that you, you can uh, ensure this modularity, uh, like can essentially make sure that someone can develop the code uh, and you never really know how it's built, right? Uh, that's fine. So. That's really the, the 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 motivation here, and the question is like, is it really like efficient uh, in terms of saving space in any possible way? And the answer is probably not really, because you have a one instance of libc on disk, but every time you build your main.c func uh, like code and link against this libc, the executable which the compiler will produce if you link statically. You say like, okay, do not allow any dynamic libraries. It will suck all of these object files together and it will dump them on disk in your main, whatever you call your executable, right? So like in the case of, of our like shell, I think I, I forgot if I ask for, no, I don't ask for static linking, but 
imagine uh, we would instead of like and again it's hidden from you so you do really uh, use dynamic linking underneath but if we would say link everything statically you would get a, a giant uh shell executable with which sucks all this printf and libc implementation inside so okay not a very good way to of saving space and this is specifically the reason why people came up with this idea of shared libraries so they are dot so shared objects on unix or dlls on windows so if i ask you a question again what are those so how are they different from shared libraries yeah so what you're saying is that we somehow will be sharing this library in memory. So instead of like linking against uh, libc and bundling it together, we'll have a single copy of libc in memory, right? And this single copy of libc will be shared between multiple processes. Correct. So, and let me just give you some numbers and I will explain how it works because again, from this, from this short discussion, it's not really clear. So again, like if we're trying to save memory on disk and in memory aggressively, if we say, okay, uh, my typical Unix system may have like 1000 programs in slash bin, for example, right? If we link statically, we will have once all these copies of printf, right? And if I ask you a question, so if you try to guess how big printf can be, what would be your guess? Hundreds of lines of code. Hundreds of lines of code, but maybe even more than hundreds of lines of code, because remember, you have to handle multiple format con conversions, like for floating points, specify how many like digits before and after the, the point, right? Stuff like that. Like maybe even a thousand slide line of code, right? And so again, I forget where I got this number from, but uh, uh, like this is like a specific, if I like on my previous Linux machine, if I did LS and count the number, like this is a useful example of pipeline, right? I, I want to ask a question, how many programs are in my user bin? I need to just do ls and then pipe into wc minus l, right, which counts the lines. So I, I counted 2,504 programs, right, back then. And if we say, look, printf is a thousands of lines, it was estimated to be roughly 5 to 10 kilobytes of code, right? So if you multiply this number by this number, it would be just 10 to 25 megabytes of disk space. If, I, if each of my instances of this executable files in the inside bin was statically linked against, against uh, printf, right? Kind of a big, biggish number, especially if you're building something like a embedded system, right? Today or 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it was still big for a disk, right? So you say like, I don't want to do it, right? So, and another thing is that if you again load it in memory, and back then, the way I counted uh, how many programs I was running, I said uh, PS is a tool which shows all the programs in the system from all users. And I again piped it into WC minus L. I was running, my laptop was running 250, 250 programs, right? So, and again, you multiply one by another, you again wasting roughly one megabyte to 2.5 megabytes of memory space just running multiple instances of printf and what you want to do instead is the following diagram so you say look i will have a single copy of let's say printf for simplicity All right and let's say printf.all just it's not wrapped inside any of the any of the libc libraries or anything what I want to do, I, I want to have a single instance on disk and we'll never link against it explicitly, right? Up, up front before loading in memory. But when I start a program, which is, let's say I have something like WC, right? WC is tiny. So we create an address space for WC. 
we load WC in memory. So it will be WC's text and data section, right? And what we're going to do is let's say, we say, well, okay, printf also has a text and data section. So let's load it in memory as well. So it will have a text section and maybe its own data section. And this is printf. But we never like explicitly merge them on disk. So we're only linking them when we load the program in memory, right? At this point, we say, look, we have this L file and we're so tricky, but it has the second table, right? Which tells us how we can quickly merge those sections, right? And instead of merging, we actually somehow, I, I, I on purpose kind of made a picture of them being separate, right? But somehow you, you just loaded WC, you loaded printf in memory, and you somehow patched everything together and it calls correct functions in printf. Okay, that kind of looks similar to a static linking. So what's the benefit? The benefit comes when you start loading another program in memory. So for example, uh, my PS program, which I loaded as part of this pipeline. For the PS, the operating system also constructs the address space and also loads like a text and a data section of a PS. This is PS. But the key point here is that like if you if you simply wanted to save space on disk, you would load this printf library in memory here, right? As well. And uh, you would have two instances of printf, kind of logical, right? So you saved space on disk because you never linked anything on disk, but you saved space in memory if you really load printf twice in data. Uh, so there's copy one and copy two. But the key optimization which printing systems are doing is that actually they share this instance. So this actually is a single memory. So this printf is loaded only once, like the text section at least, right? And it's shared by making sure that virtual addresses or virtual memory of uh, WC and virtual memory of uh, PS are actually pointing to the same instance of physical memory, right? So you really like having one instance of printf in memory, right? Is this high level idea clear that you can share like that? Now I'll ask you a question. So can you, so like, or rather what can you share? Which sections of the printf you can share? Code. You can share code, right? Because, because you can make sure that the code is actually read only and executable. So it's identical code, right? Between the two, between the two processes, WC and PS, right? What about the data section? Yeah, exactly. So you can share the read-only data, right? So read-only data would be perfectly shareable because it's the same, it cannot be modified, right? But this writable data should be private. Do you agree with that? Because if WC writes something in the data section here and sets something to one and the PS does not, it's still zero, right? So you have, you need two instances of the data of the writable data section and the same for the BSS, writable BSS, right? Agree with this? So roughly speaking, this is what's done, right? But there is another complication, which is a little bit unusual. Let me take a different color. So everything is fine, right? But in order to share between them, between the two processes, the text section should be really identical. It's the same memory, right? Which means that it has to be loaded at the same address A, right? Because, well, you somehow resolve that if you like accessing a data section here uh, or accessing another functions in the data section, they are sitting, and if you're not using relative addresses, then they should be the same addresses, right? Otherwise, you like you cannot put A here and B here. They will be different, right? And this becomes a little bit problematic because like you can go for a while, and as long as in every program which you are running, this address A is available, you can do this trick. You can load the printf function, uh, the text action, like the addresses will be the same. But what happens if this address is already unavailable? 
Huh? Same report. No, not the same report. Like, uh, like you, you're operating system designer, so you're looking for a solution for how to solve it, right? Wouldn't you just like kind of tell the process to wait your turn? You know, it's like that whole. You you tell the process what? To wait your turn to be able to use it. Why? Uh, it's not available. It's, it's not available, right? So you can always not available. Yeah, it will always oh, be. Only... <laughs> no, because maybe you load at a giant. Your the tax action is so big that this address is already taken. Yeah. Yeah, you can do at this point. You say, this is where like, in the past, those techniques diverged. So Windows literally for a long time was using this idea that they cannot fix a preferable loadable, loadable address for those libraries. And they would load and share for as long as they can. If the address is suddenly un unavailable, this process is no longer sharing this library. They will have a private instance which will be loaded and relocated somewhere else, right? That's fine, so it works, but as the number of libraries in the system was growing, this became, this was becoming more and more problematic, right? There is an alternative approach. This approach is called position independent code. The idea is to come up with the specific uh, code uh, construction, which allows you to essentially make sure that the same text, like it's a text of printf, and I like, let's assume this is a data section, this is a text. Like imagine there is like, it calls a function here. So this is A calls B. It can run if loaded at different addresses. This loaded at A, this is loaded at B and still runs. The, meaning that this, this code section here and here is the same code section, identical, no difference in, in any of the bits. Uh, if I ask you a question, that's a good design exercise. How will you design this code? I mean, first of all, let's understand what the problem is. Okay, question. Almost correct. So what you're saying is that, okay, let me first explain what the problem is, right? So imagine this function A takes an argument which uh, comes from the from the data section, right? So in, in this data section, this is address X, and in this data section, because it, it got moved a little, right? So it's A and B are different. So it's X plus some delta, for example, right? So like you cannot use this absolute address X in the code here, right, around A, just because it will be different. It, in one copy, it's X, in another copy, it's X plus delta, right? But you can make an observation, but maybe it's relative, you said, to the start, so to this start of this text section, right? But you sometimes don't even know where the start is, right? Because you don't keep the start, although you can keep the start. So this construction is also possible. But really what they came up with is that this distance from the point of invocation to the data section, the data section always follows the code section, right? Is always the same. So it's here in here, these two lines, they are the same, right? So they're like some number of bytes, right? Let's say Y, right? And if you can compute this distance, like, okay, you know the distance at the point of linking, so it's static, right? If you can compute the current value of the instruction pointer, EAP, you can just say EAP plus Y will give me the address of X. Does it make sense? And then your code is like, because the distance Y is always constant, so you know it, so it's the same in both. So you just have to compute EAP, right? Agree with this? That's kind of an elegant trick because you say, now I can share, I can put this code anywhere in the, in the address space and still runs as long as the data section sits, roughly speaking, right above the code section, right? But it can be like offset at somewhere. It doesn't really matter. And of course the data sections are private. So this like, but that's achieved with virtual memory. So essentially this one gets mapped to a physical page one and this one gets mapped to a physical page two. So they, they have two different instances, but they say, and I will explain how it works later on, just bear with me for a sec, or like use your knowledge of virtual memory from previous classes. But 
but they sit at the same address, right? So that's the main idea behind the position in the independent code, right? Uh, I will briefly, again, we will never use it in this class, but I just wanted to make sure that you understand that it's there. And all the modern executables, you open the GDB, you will see this position independent, independent code construction. I will next time quickly go through this position independent code to just to explain, illustrate, because if you ever open a debugger and I told you, okay, there is like, there should be like just, just an address and it's not an address. So you will be ready, but we will spend maybe like 10, 15 minutes on that. And then just start booting into main essentially tomorrow. But uh, okay, so thank you. Let me stop here. See you Thursday.